triangle tests. Uh, you hear this a lot. Maybe you read or follow a podcast or two where they're mentioning this. And uh, I know for me it's just a cool thing because I like uh, I like science and this fits into the science category for me. Um, but anyway, tonight I'm going to go through these in a manner that hopefully when you leave, whether you're ever doing a triangle test or not, you're getting some information here that applies to sensing, tasting, feedback, etc. Okay, that's not really the point of the presentation, but you will get information that helps you with that, and that thereby improve your beer. So, there's a lot of measurements we use when we make beer, right? Yeah, while we're brewing, anyway, there are a lot of measurements. And then you get all done, and um, I'm just going to struggle with this because I meant to turn it off and fail. Um, so you get all done, and there are no measures. You come to a club like this and ask people, why does it taste like that, right? And maybe you show them some of those numbers, but really, if you're not there while the brewing's going on, so what? Um, so, triangle tests are useful for sensory, people-oriented measurements, okay? They're used all the time in food industry and beer industry for this purpose in a very scientific manner. Um, uh, so, the idea here is to figure out what things are affecting what we're tasting. It's a very simple method. You only figure out one thing at a time, but... If you do it over time, you'll get to where you know a lot of things. Um, and if you do something specific with your brewing process, you know, it ought to change the beer, hopefully in a sensible way. Sometimes it doesn't change it in a sensible way, and that's good, because you're like, hey, look, I don't have to uh, lager my beer for a, a, a year. It turns out, two weeks, I can't taste the difference. So, you know, that's cool. So the results can be, you know, either way, they can be good. Um, and they, what I'm going to go through should improve your ability to be objective about feedback you get and about feedback you give. So what is a triangle test? Oh, maybe some people thought this is why they were here tonight. Okay? No. No. Uh, often involves colored plastic cups. Uh, usually not that many and not with ping pong balls. So if that's going on, you are not at a triangle test. Right? So, all right. Uh, it's called a triangle test because there's three samples given to you, right? Two of them are the same, one's different, and you're trying to say, hey, which one's the different one? That's, you're going to help me tonight with one of these tests, and you're going to tell me what you think the different one is. And it matters, if you can't tell the difference, you still guess one. You have to pick one, okay? Do your best. Maybe you'll taste one that's obviously different, maybe not, but you're still going to pick one. And only one. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the difference is, right? That can bias you. It starts you thinking like what you're looking for. That you don't want to do that. Um, if there's no difference, so if I hand out something literally, like say I handed out water to all of you, and you all have to pick one, so by random chance, we should get one third of every single choice was one of the three samples. So if the samples are colored or numbered, well not numbered, they're colored, I'll get one third of them are red, one third are blue, and one third are green as your results, okay? That never really happens because there's always a little variance, but closely. So um, a triangle test does not do you any good in measuring degree of difference. So how much more bitter is it? Yeah, you know, you might feel like, hey, I'm tasting one's really more bitter, but the outcome of the test is not how much more bitter. It's just more bitter. Right? It's not a unit. Um, and actually, it's really just I tasted it different. Uh, statistical analysis has to be used. Uh, I'm going to have a slide here in a little bit. I'll show you like why would you have to use statistics. Uh, there's an easy out on that though. There's very simple calculators for these kinds of simple tests. So it's not like you have to go study stats to deal with that. And then, um, you know, if you're if you're in a business where you know lots of money's at stake, you're going to want to run reams and reams of these tests. Like I've talked to the QA guy at Fatheads, and they're testing all the time to control and uh, know that they're putting out this close to the same product. You can sure bet the big guys do that, right? because our customers have an expectation of what they're getting. Um, so what can it tell us? It can tell us a desirable outcome uh, can be detected or not. It can also tell us an undesirable outcome can be detected or not. Um, uh, it can tell us if we change something, does it matter? Uh, it can tell us, you know, hey, my friends are telling me this matters. Uh, I saw an experiment on DMS once, like putting a lid on the pot and that and so forth. And, it came up with, I mean, 
you can fight with the statistics behind it, but it came out with it didn't matter. I'm like, really? So, uh, anyway, uh, you can determine if something changed unintentionally. So, that's really what a lot of food manufacturers are doing, right? They're constantly doing these triangle tests to make sure something didn't change that they didn't know about. Like, hey, you're sending me all this malt, and I'm thinking it's always the same malt, but you screw up and put the wrong thing in the bag, you're gonna notice that before it gets out instantly, right? You might not know what malt, but you're gonna know, hey, this isn't right, and uh, it ain't going out. Uh, and that's the last bullet there, QA professionals doing consistency. Um, so beer brewing test methods. There are a lot of these, but the triangle test is the most common. So for most tests, we're changing the brewing process, but you could change the ingredient, right? You could change your brewing system, new burner. <laughs> the silly little, silliest little things. Uh, I saw one experiment that said fermenting in glass and plastic matter. You wouldn't even think to test that. Uh, okay, so how do you set this up? Well, the most reliable way is if you're brewing beer, split the beer in two batches or more, and then treat that, so this is after wort, right? After wort, split it and do different things, but you, this is no good for while still mashing, right? Or while you're maybe changing a recipe ingredient. That won't help. Um, sequential batches on a single system, I personally do that because the way, just the way I brew, it's real easy for me to do that, but it's not really perfect because they're not the same source. You got to try to deliberately be very careful to be the same each time you brew. Some people have two identical brewing systems. I don't know them, but I guess some people do, so they'll just side by side brew the same exact way during the day best they can, and then they know whatever they vary is truly a difference between the two. And the last one is a lot of tests on different systems. As a club, we could do that. In fact, we, man, we didn't really do it, but we could have done it when we did the big brew and we did all the different approaches. We could have said, hey, we're just going to deliberately vary several things along here and then get results and do triangle tests. You could do that. Uh, okay. Triangle tests, so as I said, there's a lot of tests. Triangle tests are really easy to do. They're really easy to screw up interpretations and the setups, but they're very easy to do. Oops. Uh, they're very simple to carry out, and they're very easy to analyze. So that's why you see them coming up a lot, and even talked about, because you can understand them easily. Um, there's a lot of errors in all testing and in all feedback. So. There's two slides here that I list errors on. I'm not going through all these. Just these are my favorites on this slide because almost every time I judge beer, these are happening. So for example, uh, number one, expectation, irrelevant influence. I don't, I hardly ever sit on a table where someone doesn't start talking about the style I'm about to taste and something they think about it and this and that. And that's actually even a no-no. It's not even talking about the beer you're actually tasting, that's just talking about, even about judging and things you've experienced. You really should just start fresh, don't talk. Um, suggestions, big pet peeve. I know a lot of judges will say, you know, hey, don't talk until we're done. And that's why, because any little word can throw you off, you know. Any little word. Someone says, oh, I'm tasting X. <laughs> you start tasting X. Um, leniency and harshness. This is kind of funky, but if someone says this beer has a fault, for example, and you haven't tasted that, even though you don't taste it, you're not going to score it, you're going to actually mentally lower your estimation of the beer. So your scores will go down if someone says, I think I taste a fault. Even though you may be like, ah, you know what you're talking about, blah, blah, work it out. You still lower your scores because of that. And likewise, someone saying, man, is this beer good? As soon as they sip it, like, I don't even like to make eye contact when I'm judging. I don't want to see the person's face for that reason because it, it can bias you. And I, I could say that uh, in a commercial setting, they do testing like this in a little booth, in a room, like red lights, totally, you can imagine, it's a totally controlled environment. No one's talking to anybody, you know. It's, they totally limit the input a person gets. So, part of the reason I'm telling you this too is so when you experience this triangle test today and when you hear others talk, you're a little, little bit, I don't know, fuzzy about how you interpret the results because unless you really do all those things, then, you know, we're all in a room, we're talking, we had some beer, other beers, you know, 
the, the results are not as they would be in a really solid setting. But then we're not going to make a million dollars worth of beer based on the outcome. Um, and then stimulus, we know this when we judge, those of us who judge like, you know, a white tablecloth, a room with good light, no funky smells floating around, you know, all those things can throw you off. And I'm not going to go through all these except to say, uh, what is the total count here? There's four, uh, there's ten, ten, ten possible things it can affect and none of these are like silly rare things, they're all real. And, you know, really serious people, they take all kinds of steps to address things. And if you want to study them, look them up. This will be up there, you know. So, um, now, blind experiments. I threw this in here. We're not going to do something like this, but you hear this phrase, too, like I did a blind or double blind test. And what, what difference does that make? Well, <clears throat> basically, it's generally to eliminate a lot of those other errors. And then there's this thing called a placebo effect. We've probably all heard of that one. If you just so much as tell somebody, hey, this is a test, placebo, they say, you know, yeah, placebo, 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 placebo. So, <laughs> but yeah, if you just tell somebody you're participating in a test, they get all more scrutinizing, tougher, and their scores go down, right? Just, just telling someone they're doing a test messes things up. Um, generally, they use some kind of control group around that, but there you go. Um, the people serving the beer to you, like during a test, it's like in a commercial setting, they slide it through a door, you never see them. That's why. You don't want to know if it's man, woman, old, young, anything. You don't want to, you just want to have the beer show up for you. Because those all can influence you. And then there's all kinds of biases. This, this one really kind of got me that Sometimes they don't want the researcher who's collecting all the data to know what the composition of the testers is. So like they don't want them to know how many men, women, age, ethnicity, nothing. So they only give them numbers to analyze. And that's because you can have all these other biases just in the analysis. So not, forget all the testing, you've got all that. Wow, when I look at the numbers, if I'm told just a little bit too much about the numbers, it screws up the way I think about them and so forth, and how seriously I take them. So, so as I said, there's a potential way to use control groups. That's required in any blind experiment. You've got to have a group that does... You tell everyone they're being tested, and you have a group that really, they're all getting the same thing. Okay, and that's kind of a benchmark then for the other results. We're not going into it. Um, you don't typically do these in amateur settings. So I'm talking kind of fast at the moment. Are there any questions up to this point or reaction to any of this? <laughs> good? It's good? You can hear me. Your thumbs are needing drying out. Thank you, Erica. Okay, there are three types of blind tests, and you hear these, single, double, triple. I kind of went through it already. It's like, well, the control group is the minimum, Double blind is where the people, you know, running the test and the people doing the test, none of them really knows what's going on. They know they're in a test, that's it. And then the last one is the one where they don't even, the guys in analyzing numbers don't even know. All right, so back to triangle test. So a triangle test, we present three items, two are the same, one is different. In this scenario I put there, it's like A1 and A2 are the same beer, it's just sample one of A, and sample two of A, and then B is the actual different beer, right? Uh, generally use colored cups and other means to make sure people don't get the sequential bias, like one is always better than two, and A is better than B, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and then, uh, as I said earlier, you have to select one item. Um, okay, <laughs> the statistical part of this. Uh, uh, yeah, you got to have statistics in this to know really what the answers mean. Now, there's a slide coming up that will explain that, but this really makes you ask the question. So let's say I have 60 people in a room, approximately what we have here, and I give you all samples of water, and for all you know, I doctored one with an off flavor, right? But you don't know, and I look at your results when you're done, you got 20 on sample, the first sample of A, 20 on the second sample A, and 20 on B, right? No one tasted a difference. I might even have put something in there, but I put it at such a low level, it turns out that's the level below the threshold of sensing, and there you go. It didn't matter, okay? No difference detected. But if you can see the bottom three, they're kind of low, but 
So like I got, what if A1 is 15 and A2 is 25? B would still be 20. Does that, is that test, what does that test mean? <laughs> you know? Because that's actually a little more realistic because there's some randomness involved and you never get 20, 20, 20 in that kind of test. You get some variation. And then the second item is like, well, what if A1 and 2 are 19 and B's 22? So B's just got a couple more people. Does that matter? Does that mean B was noticeably different or was that just random? Probably, probably. And then the last one where B's 27, you got the other numbers on A. Okay, is that different? The question I'm trying to get to here is like, what's different enough? Okay, just having one more that's different doesn't count. Two more is different. You got to know where to draw the line, and that's where the statistics come in. Without getting all the math behind them. And the math isn't that hard, but why bother? You don't really need to. Um, so, what is statistically significant? That means that something in there is beyond random. Like flipping a coin, if you flipped a quarter and it came down heads a hundred times, what would you think? You wouldn't think that was the normal coin or thumb or table or something. Like that. Right, exactly. It wouldn't be the normal thing. So, and as I showed in the last slide, the question is where, how many times flipping the coin does it become like that's not random and I should look into this quarter or this thumb, whatever. Okay. And then, um, it also indicates that you should take action, or, or taking action would be useful. You can affect that by looking into like, hey, I added this mall to change things. That, that made a difference. I can add less or more, depending on what I was trying to do there. Right? Isn't uh, 60 an important number? Isn't 60 statistically a good number? Yeah, you know, I, in my past, I had stats classes, and I always tell people 40 or something, but 60 is a... I remember 60. Yeah, it's a certain types of test, 40 or 60 in that range. Less than that, you get where the results really, you can get results. But. Okay, so how to ruin chocolate chip cookies. My answer is by doing this math. It's, it's not that hard, but still, you don't have to go there. The thing we're going to measure is, is, statistically speaking, is called chi squared, an X with a 2. And all it's doing is telling you, oh, ooh, nice, very good, play. It's telling you don't touch the control because you're screwed up. 95% of the time, if you touch the control, you're going to mess up. Uh, we're getting here. I couldn't start from the end because that was slide you're not supposed to see. Oh, okay. Well, we could do a triangle test and figure that out. Uh, okay, so, so where's the damn laser? Okay, so this guy. I like pictures, okay? And, you know, the math up here and the statistical principles just are saying, like, look, see this blue area? When your results get to where there's that much probability that, you know, the thing that happened is not chance and there's this much, I'm sorry, that it, it's, it's not chance, there's this much that it is, then that's telling you, like, that's no accident. You know, when you have that little bit of chance visually, then that's the real thing. So, now I'm going to show you... Uh, this is a web page you go to and plug in triangle test numbers real easily, and it gives you results. And this is an example. So, what if, uh, what this is saying is, for sample A, which I gave, you know, 22 samples of that to, to um, this is based on uh, having, I'm sorry, wait, 60 people. So, they all had uh, the same number of samples of A, a2 and B, and this is what they told me about A, 32 of them said A is the different one, 28 of them told me B was the different one. You would have expected 40 and 20, all these tests, this will be the same. And the result of this gives you this actual statement, says this is statistically significant. So eight more, 20 would be expected, right? Eight, 28, eight more is statistically significant. That matters. And more than that, it just gets more certain. And it, it can obviously get more than that. Uh, here's two other cases. Um, and this one has 34 and 26. So six people were able to say uh, B was different. And by the way, that doesn't mean they're right. It just means they thought B, that many, that was the result. Not significant. <laughs> so 
26 is not, significant 28 is, and 27 is not quite. So there's your kind of boundary. Now that's with 60 people. Um, okay. I personally thought it'd be a little higher, <laughs> but that's the deal. Um, these guys I'm not going to attempt to show you, but you can have some fun if you go to these links. I'm going to post this because the, the point here is, are there ways to do this, a triangle test, where the outcome does not require any statistical analysis? And uh, a few of you saw like a uh, video I put on my Facebook of a ropey beer. That would not require statistical analysis. So if a beer is really horribly bad, you open it, it smells like poop. Uh, you know, it's it just, you know, you put it in your mouth, it's incredibly sour and unpalatable. You don't need statistics to tell you that beer is... <laughs> We're required to try. <laughs> I drank that slimy beer, it actually tasted fine. I didn't, it wasn't that bad mouth it was, but yeah. We're actually required to try. Uh, beer in theory is safe, no matter what, because of the alcohol. But anyway, so, uh, sorry. Uh, and the other, so uh, these are just two videos, but one is, has anyone ever seen Canadian bacon with John Candy? No? So John Candy says this beer sucks, he's at a hockey game, and the entire stadium gets in a fight with him over it. So it's like, you know you're wrong when every single other person in the room says you're wrong. You don't need statistics, right? And, and the other one is a uh, dumb and dumber, but uh, you have to look them up. That's the one where it's like, you know when you taste it, it's just like ridiculously bad. No stats required. Um, so hopefully this will help you brew. Um, you can use reliable feedback like this when you brew. Sometimes that feedback will come from people talking. You may read about it in a magazine. You know, you may contemplate doing something and, and you know, share with people like, what if I do this test? You'll uh, be able to get more reliable feedback. Um, hopefully you can share more reliable feedback, particularly if you keep in mind those errors, the things that can screw you up that I listed, go back and review. I think most of them in BJCP too, they list things that like you should avoid like don't smoke a cigar the day before, but that's not bias, that's just ruined your palate. Uh, anyway, interpret information, you uh, interpret what you hear, read, understand, opinions not. Oh, and the other thing is significance. So, um, uh, this has happened quite a few times to me where I'm talking to somebody after a contest, a week or two later, and they're talking about the, their score sheets, and they say to me like, this one judge, I don't know what to do. My beer, he said this about my beer. What am I going to do about that? I've got to run off and do it. I've got to change something. What do I do? And I'm like, one judge said that? What the other judge said? You know? One judge, feedback from one person, that's just, don't worry about it, okay? Great thing about a club like this, uh, great thing about judging beers, when you get to talk about beer, is you get a lot of feedback from different people. It doesn't mean disregard any of it, but look for like the common factor in this feedback, right? Not just, don't freak out if one person says X. That's a lot of triangles. What are you talking about, Mike? Yeah, that's a lot of triangles. <laughs> you, can, you can actually do tests like that with more than three things, but uh, that gets really complicated. And then, um, yeah, if you want to, you know, you're thinking there's something you want to check out, you convince some people to help you out. I mean, you, you can use this to run a test to learn something, you know, or you can listen to... There's a, a podcast out there you can listen to about it. So, um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do a triangle test with those of you up to about 40, because that's how many things I'm prepared to serve, which might leave five or ten people. I hope not more than that. <clears throat> You're going to get three samples, and um, there's going to be cups with dots on them that have colors, and if you guys, Clive and Mike, I should have told you earlier, pour, pour quickly. Oh my God. Close the door while you're pouring. Okay, so. Everybody in this room likes something. Tim said that it sucks. Who do you believe? Tim. John Candy would say that is not a good position to be in. Okay, not good. So, here's what we're going to do. Mike and Clive are setting up samples for us. Okay, you're going to get three samples. One of them might be different. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. Okay. These samples, I'm going to give you some handouts. 
Yeah, can you, here, go ahead. I want to keep the one. So, when they're serving the samples, you should put the like colors on the like dot. I mean, it's not critical, but that's the intention here. These are in a triangle, so they're not in a line, because people tend to prefer the thing on the left or the right, or on the left and the right hand. So, so that's another triangle. So, and the one thing you gotta remember is I screwed up again, and the blue dot, that's your red dot. Turned out when I put the blue sticker on these cups, you cannot see it. So, you'll get a yellow dot, a green dot, and a red dot. All you gotta do is put an X on the one you think is different. And once you hand your paper into me, go off and socialize, and somehow or another, I'll tabulate the results and tell you, you know, whether it was significant, right? And there are, are there any questions?